Yeah, okay, so next topic, let's look at imagination. Uh, there we are. Uh, look, let's look at a few experiments. So experiments have shown that we can change our brain anatomy simply by using our imaginations. Uh, and let's bring some of that to life. Uh, so in a study by Pascual Lyon, uh, he taught two groups of people who had never played piano. Uh, so group A were the mental practice group. Uh, and so for two hours a day, they imagined playing only. They were not allowed to touch a keyboard. Uh, group B played for two hours a day actually at the keyboard. So they, they did this for five days and the test showed it at the end of that that B was better than A. Okay, hurrah, yes, no surprise there. But, and it's a big but, when group A received just two hours of actual practice, group A came up to the same level of skill as group B. So from that, clearly mental practice is an effective way to prepare for a physical skill. Uh, let's find another group study. Okay, imagining bigger muscles. Uh, I love this one. <laughs> Two groups um, exercising the pinky of all muscles. Uh, hilarious. So group A did exercise. Group B imagine doing exercise five days a week for a month, uh, exercising their little pinky. I can't imagine what they had, little mini dumbbells, whatever they did. Uh, at the end of the study, group A, 30% increase in muscular strength. Terrific. The group that just imagined, 22% increase. Uh, hard to believe, but that was the case. A little quick sidebar here on this same fellow, Pascual Leon, who studied Braille students and found that cramming for knowledge and skills only builds temporary neural connections. So slow, steady work, most likely to build new connections that solidify learning. I think we touched on that in another topic. Um, here's a um, fun exercise, <laughs> signing your name. Uh, look, when you imagine writing your name with your non-dominant hand, it'll take longer to both imagine and to write it. Okay, so here let me write it with my non-dominant left hand. This is me. Okay, and that is just godforsaken terrible. It looks like I haven't slept for a week. Uh, now, the trick here is that even when I imagine writing with my non-dominant hand, I kind of come up with that same kind of image. It's not fluent. Uh, as it is with my right hand. So the imagination is doing the same thing as what I'm doing physically. Uh, so here we are at the point both mental imagery and actions are thought to be uh, slowed because they are both products of the same motor program in the brain. Uh, and here we have long viewed our imaginative life with a kind of sacred awe uh, as noble, pure, ethereal, cut off from the material brain. Now we cannot be so sure about where to draw the line. That's a direct quote from the book. Uh, so I guess some fun there, but ultimately it proves how powerful the imagination really is. Okay, so let's see if I can get back to uh, the center. Okay, so let's look at rejuvenation. Here we are, uh, very briefly. Um, so look, there's two main ways to increase neurons in the brain. Uh, neurons being the basic building block of the brain uh, uh, via exercise or learning. Uh, so when you look at exercise, uh, they've studied mice and that mice have ex that have exercised had an increase in the number of neurons. Uh, and they found that the exercise doesn't have to be that strenuous. Fast walking is sufficient. And the theory on that is that fast walking used to take the animals and us into new environments uh, when we're on the plains and that required new learning. So exercise uh, will create new neurons. The other way is through learning and they found that in studies again on mice uh, that they were if in environments where they could learn using toys, balls, other stimuli, neurons actually lived longer. So yeah, combining those two, so physical exercise and learning uh, work in complementary ways. The first makes new neurons and the second to prolong their uh, survival. So exercise and learning combined can uh, lead to uh, more neurons in the brain. Uh, a side point here, and it's something a lot of people have an interest in, is Alzheimer's and dementia and what you can do to potentially avoid. Um, they have found that uh, subjects with more education that are socially and physically active and that engage in constant mental, uh, mentally stimulating activities, you know, activities that actually involve genuine concentration, uh, like a musical instrument, not so much golf. Those type of activities, all of these things can actually lead so that you're less likely to, to get Alzheimer's disease or dementia. It's, the studies all stop short, they're kind of suggestive, but they stop short of proving prevention. But these activities are certainly not harmful by any stretch and uh, some are showing that um, they assist in uh, avoiding getting Alzheimer's. Right, okay, so let's look at uh, the next topic, brain culture.
uh, and this is uh, you know how the brain shapes culture and culture shapes the brain and let's just look at uh, for the sake of brevity a couple of interesting points uh, or cultural activities that that shape the brain uh, Let's look at music. Well, music makes extraordinary demands on the brain. The brain imaging shows that musicians have quite different maps of the motor cortex and the cerebellum uh, to non-musicians. And in particular, if a musician starts playing before you know roughly seven years of age, they have even more connections between the hemispheres. Uh, so between the two brain hemispheres, the bridging is uh, more extensive with someone that's been playing music for since they were very young. Um, another cultural activity is driving a cab. So in a study showed that more years a London taxi driver had, the larger the volume of his hippocampus and the part of the brain that actually stores spatial representations. So driving a London cab can be taxing. Yeah, you, you must have suspected that joke was coming. Uh, please don't act surprised. Uh, okay, a big one here. Television, music, videos and games uh, or or pervasive right now in our culture. Uh, all these things unfold at a much faster rate than real life and they are actually getting faster. You just have to watch an episode of CSI to, to see that. You know, these cuts, edits, zooms, pans, <coughs> excuse me, sudden noises, etc. alter the brain by activating the orientating response. What's that? I hear you ask. Orientating response occurs whenever we sense a sudden change in the world around us especially a sudden movement and it's we instinctively interrupt whatever we're doing so it's an instinct uh, whatever we're doing to turn pay attention and get our bearings uh, how did it become an instinct let's have a look at the orientating response the orientating response evolved because our forebears were both predators and prey and needed to react to situations that could be dangerous or could provide sudden opportunities for such things as food and sex I certainly want to be aware of those things when they come up uh, Response is uh, physiological. Uh, we, our actual heart rate decreases for four to six seconds when this occurs. Um, the thing is that with television, for example, this puts us in a continuous orient orientating response with really no recovery. Uh, and this is why you will see that some people complain of being exhausted after watching television for a few hours. Um, there is a cost to this potentially and, and some would say a, a real cost and that is activities like reading, complex conversation and listening to lectures, perhaps even watching this presentation, become even more difficult and we start to dumb down our curriculums as a result. Uh, in the book uh, they talk a little or he talks a little about McLuhan's first law of media and, and really what this is all about is that media are extensions of aspects of man. Uh, so you know for example, riding extends memory, car that extends the foot, clothing, the skin, uh, and here we are, electronic media are actually extensions of our nervous system. Uh, radio telephone extending the ear, uh, television extending sight, and computer now extending our processing capabilities of our central nervous system. Uh, and McLuhan, uh, in his rules here, argues that the process of extending our nervous system also actually alters it. Electronic media and nervous system basically work in very similar ways. Uh, and here's a key point, because our nervous system is plastic, it can take advantage of this compatibility and merge with electronic media, making a single larger system. And uh, I suggest that the trend that they're kind of advocating there is that we're becoming more and more entwined with um, electronic media to the point where I know if someone loses their phone or their camera, they've often said they feel like they've lost a piece of them. Uh, the, how we demarcate between ourselves and electronic media seem to be becoming fuzzier and fuzzier uh, by the day. Okay, so this is just a, a brief overview of brain culture. And so we're back at the centre. Wow, okay, so that was um, all the topics. Uh, what I wanted to hear is potentially just a last word. Uh, it's not a summary, so to speak, just a few ideas that I found throughout the book that I wanted to make sure I left you with. Um, okay, so yeah, what did... Let me get a brush here. So what did the author find? Well, this is a crude summary, I guess. The brain changed its structure with every activity performed. If certain parts of the brain failed, then other parts could take over. Um, thinking, learning, acting can actually turn our genes on or off. Uh, and through case studies and looking at different patients, we've learned that blind people can learn to see, deaf to hear, stroke victims to recover, all due to the plasticity of our brain. Uh, one analogy that I loved, which is hidden in the book, uh, is that neuroplasticity is like um, plasticity is like pliable snow on a hill. And this is us. Here's the um, pliable snow. Uh, when we go down the hill on a sled, we can take different paths through the soft snow each time. But if we take the same path two or three times, tracks start to develop, and soon we get stuck in a rut. 
our route will now be quite rigid as neural circuits once established tend to become self-sustaining just like the imagery that that analogy portrays and that yeah we have a tendency to once we form a, a route we go down that uh, because we're, we're safe in the knowledge that we've used it before uh, another concept in the book that I didn't know where to put except maybe in the last word was this concept of a uh, plastic paradox and that not only neuroplastic neuroplasticity has the power to produce more flexible but else it also has powerful rigid it can also make our behavior more rigid um, some of the most stubborn habits and disorders are products of our plasticity uh, and they can prevent other changes from occurring so not only uh, we get all the benefits of neuroplasticity we can also fall into habits much easier because of the the very same concept a quote that I really enjoy in the book we must be learning to feel alive and when life or love becomes too predictable it seems like there is little left to learn we become restless a protest perhaps of our plastic brain when it can no longer perform its essential task and to bring this to life we look at a lifeline um, a typical lifeline of 0 to 80 uh, and it's remarkable what goes on here so that we've talked about the critical period when our nucleus bacillus is kind of turned on 24 7 we're always learning new things and then as we grow through teenage years and early 20s 30s we're trying new things careers relationships and the comments made that uh, middle age can be deceptively boring we're not often engaging in new tasks that require focused attention and then if you do the mathematics and if our you know our expected life is up through to 80 years of age uh, touch wood uh, we may not have engaged the brain systems that regulate plasticity for over 50 years so that's pretty incredible uh, and so what that tells us is that it's healthy at any age to engage in any activity that demands focused attention things like new physical activities, solving puzzles, career changes, new languages. These activities are brilliant at any time, uh, any age that you're at. And to finish up here, three examples that I kind of adored. Uh, Benjamin Franklin at 78 invented the bifocal spectacle. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright at 90 designed the Guggenheim Museum. And the famous uh, cellist uh, Pablo Casillas at, I think that's 96, uh, when he was asked by a student why do you continue to practice? He replied, uh, because I'm making progress. Well, okay, well, I'm hoping, <laughs> I hope I'm still making progress. I do hope you're still making progress. Uh, otherwise, we get restless, apparently. Okay, so let's see if I can uh, zoom out here and, uh, wrong way, and get all of our map inside. Uh, that's the book, The Brain That Changes Itself. Uh, I encourage you to get out and read it. This is not one hundredth of the material that's in the book. Uh, it's rich on every page. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I do hope you read the book. Okay, until next time.